Hello, good evening, everybody. We're so excited to start off this fall with our first high impact tea. Uh, we actually are going to be having a series of speaker events throughout the academic year, but this is the first one. And the areas of focus are gonna be, if you keep in mind, not only tonight, but in February, we're gonna have a talk focused on sustainability. And then we're hopefully around the uh, May timeframe also gonna have something focused on social equity. So it's TBD on that. Also, please note, I'm just, by the way, my name's Jennifer Walski. I'm the faculty director of Impact at Anderson. I should have started with that. Um, also with me is Mia Antonio, who's our program coordinator, and Kelly Chung, who's our program manager in the back. Um, we have some other exciting things that are gonna be happening this year out of Impact at Anderson. Uh, keep in mind, Impact Week. It's in April, April 24th is gonna be the uh, main event and that's gonna happen on the Friday. Uh, we just have confirmed Seth Goldman, who is the founder of Honest Tea, or co-founder and then also uh, chairman of Beyond Meat is gonna be one of our keynote speakers as well as others, TBD. We don't wanna give it all away today, right, Emily? <laughs> Also, we want to recognize that Bhavna Sivanand is our executive director, and she's had a wonderful baby girl, so she's not with us tonight, um, but we want to appreciate her and her leadership. And uh, equally present is our advisory board member, Lance Miller, I believe is in the audience, and I want to point and recognize him as well as Ashi Yoshi and Eric Israelian, who are our board members. So Impact at Anderson is a new initiative. It's three years young now. We have a lot of exciting programming, some of which I've already spoken about. Also keep in mind the Net Impact Consulting Challenge. Uh, if you happen to be with a nonprofit, um, talk to us. We might be full, but if you happen to be a student, as you know, applications for that are due on the 18th or 21st. And that competition is gonna be happening on November 22nd. We also have the Social Impact Consulting Corps that happen through January and March every year. And a lot of these events are powered from our fabulous MBA students, many of you who are present. And uh, we wanna recognize our Net Impact Club who got the chapter of the year. They will soon be going to the Net Impact Conference as well as second year MBA, Lizeth Rosales. Are you here, Lizeth? who helped organize this event, so we appreciate that, as well as Emily Bestwick, who's the president and leads the overall team. Uh, if you would like to get involved with Impact in a more meaningful way, we hope you will take a moment to get to know any of us. I think I pointed out some of us in the room, but we are around, and we look forward to getting to know you. Now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speaker, Eduardo Setland, MBA, class of, well, should I say what year you are? 07, it's not that long ago. Eduardo Setlin is the Executive Director of Philanthropy and Responsibility at Amgen and President of the Amgen and Amgen Safety Net Foundations. He's responsible for a portfolio of programs that serve an extension of Amgen's mission to serve patients, including efforts to inspire the next generation of scientific innovators and provide Amgen's medicines at no cost to qualifying low-income families. Eduardo is also accountable for leading the company's emerging corporate social responsibility strategy. He holds a bachelor's of science in business administration from UFMG in Brazil, fellow Brazilian, and an MBA from UCLA Anderson, of course, in our, our FIMBA program, fully employed program. So Eduardo, why don't you come on up? It is wonderful to be here with all of you today. Um, I have a few charts. I'll tell you a little bit about myself, a little bit about the work we're doing at the Amgen Foundation. Uh, then we'll have a fireside chat and Q&A. So I'm from Belo Horizonte. People say Brazil, everyone thinks the beach, carnival, soccer, can't dance. Big city in the mountains. My dad's a professor of electrical engineering and we, he went to get a postdoc in Canada when I was in high school. So the symbol you see there is West Mount High in Montreal where I got to live for two years. It was fantastic, it was an opportunity to really open my eyes to what the world had to offer, much bigger than my small hometown. Um, obviously, here at Anderson, 04 through 07, never worked harder in my life. <laughs> it was very long, uh, three years. Um, professionally, I finished school. So after high school in Canada, I went back to Brazil. And when I graduated, it was very clear in my mind, one, what kind of, why did I study business administration? I had to go through an education that would get me the opportunity to be independent. So whether I loved sociology or philosophy, those were very irrelevant questions in my family. Um, 
Went for business, joined GE's finance management program, um, had the opportunity to come to the US, uh, to Erie, Pennsylvania, it's a locomotive factory, one of the most amazing uh, warehouses I've ever seen. In one good year, the best year, GE made 1,000 locomotives, that's 50 locomotives a week. So very, very impressive work that they kept doing. Six Sigma had the opportunity to, had the fanciest title I've ever had. I was a e-finance Six Sigma black belt, which meant I dealt with the financial systems for GE. And joined Amgen in 2003. Somebody who had helped me come to the US went to Amgen to do the, to transform what was then an emerging audit function into consulting, internal consulting shop. Sarbanes-Oxley happened at the same time. That plan didn't really go well to, and didn't really come to fruition. And I said, this is not what I want to do. That's the time I applied to business school. That's the time when fortuitous uh, timing allowed me to join the Amgen Foundation as the second employee. They had then uh, brought somebody from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation to lead the work. And frankly, she hired me because the processes were all broken. She needed somebody to fix matching gifts, because it was all paper form. She needed somebody, we had these grant review meetings, we had these crates of papers that were, that need to be reviewed, and my job was to automate that. In my mind, she, that's all really she wanted. Biggest, steepest learning curve I could ever have imagined, and the best job change that I could ever have made. Very happy uh, in, in my career. 16 years at Amgen. Um, 14 of those in the foundation, and somebody says, how can you do the same thing for 14 years? And I say, I can't. This job has changed time and time again. Every year, it's a different job. Um, Colin Powell says in one of his leadership themes, I judge my team the same way my boss judges me. How am I changing my job year after year? If you look at the world where we live today, automation all around us, machine learning, artificial intelligence, it's exciting, you know, carrying supercomputers in our pockets. At Amgen, we're learning how to harness the immune system to fight cancer. That's a reality today. But it's also scary. What's the impact on our jobs? What's the impact on the jobs of our kids? 65% of tomorrow, tomorrow's workers in careers that don't even exist. And the look at the next one not change jobs. The first time I read the sentence, I was like, well, that's just changing jobs. That's, it's changing careers. There's some great uh, materials out there, uh, Mark Freeman writing about uncore careers, the idea of retirement being the age where it's the leisure <coughs> phase of life. That's gone. We're gonna work until very late in our lives. And then the challenge is how do we find meaning? How do we find impact in what we're doing? As we look forward, you look from broad society, governments, companies, Huge demands, what do we expect of our youth? What do we expect of the workforce of tomorrow? And constrained environments, not enough time, not enough resources, and sadly, a disconnect between the world of work, the future of work, and what happens in the classrooms. There's a book called Most Likely to Succeed. It's a venture capitalist called Ted Dintersmith and fellow professor from Harvard. If you were to think about our schools and how would we teach somebody to ride a bicycle, here's what we're going to do. First week, we're going to talk about the history of the bicycle. The second week, we're going to talk about all the parts of the bicycle. The third week, and if you go to a very good school, you're going to talk about physics and balancing. The fourth week, we're going to give you a test. We're going to ask you a lot of questions about the stuff you've learned over the last uh, couple of weeks. I'm going to give you an exam. We're going to expect you to ride your bike right out of the school. How is it? I don't know how many of you, mainly full-timers here. Kids are curious. Think about yourselves. You lots of questions at age three, four, why, why, why? We have an educational system that is, appears to be designed to kill curiosity. And folks say, if you wanted to design a math education in a manner that everyone's going to hate it, you deserve an A. You've done a very good job. My little girl, she's seven when she, when she went from kindergarten at Amgen, we have a very nice daycare, to first grade. She went from an environment where she could walk around, move around, play, to an expectation that she would be sitting down for five hours, the desks organized like a cemetery. 
How can that be? And then we talk to students about science. And they love the subject. They hate class. Is it their fault? They can't relate biology to their lives. If you have a body, biology is relevant for you. We believe it's time to reinvent science education from information acquisition to application. Students from passive participants to active agents of their learning and teachers from the transmitters of information to facilitators of the learning process. This is important if you say back to why does this matter for Amgen, you know, for company 40 years old, 40 miles northwest of here, simple but powerful mission to serve patients. Without a highly skilled workforce, we don't have a business. But that's not enough. We need a scientific, literate society. Think about the dialogue around vaccinations in this country. I have a picture, I have an National Geographic issue, 2015 cover, it's the moon landing fake. All this progress and so much questioning. We believe that for our company, for our industry to thrive, we have to stare into that and make the right set of investments to change that reality. Probably familiar with the sustainable development goals and the, on the right side of the chart, just a sense of $25 million is our annual budget. Sounds like a lot. If you contextualize, that's a global budget. Just the United States spends $620 billion. What we do through our philanthropy is very similar to the same kind of thinking that goes across the entire business. What are your priorities? And where, what are you gonna focus on and what are you not going to do? Sometimes I joke around that I get paid to say no. I say yes for free. I don't get to say yes very often. I, not a day goes by that we don't receive proposals from amazing nonprofit organizations doing fantastic work. As we think about what we can accomplish with our resources, these are the parameters that we have set. The research shows the number one reason behind student success after parental income is teacher quality. Now think about teachers' profession in our country. 50% of new teachers leave the profession within the first five years. And people say, of course, look at the salary. Now, People that decide to become a teacher, they know how much you're gonna make. They still go through the process and start their job as a teacher. What they don't expect is the loneliness, the lack of support, the bureaucracy of the profession. So we believe very much in the power of science teachers and investing them. And then back to the parameters I mentioned before, real world, Experience. Best way to learn science is to do science. Just a couple of highlights of how we make the kinds of investments we make. Summer research experiences are proven to really be transformational for students. We work with these 24 partners, including UCLA. Each of them recruits about three-fourths of their participants from other universities in the country. So the idea is how do we democratize access to the best world labs? One of the most competitive programs in the world, we get about 6,000 applications for uh, 350 spots a year. We bring the students together in three symposium, one in the US, right here at UCLA, one in Europe at the University of Cambridge, and one in Asia in Singapore. And the students get not only the opportunity to spend the summer doing research with the top faculty, they get a stipend, they get transportation, they get to essentially be a full-time scientist for that entire summer. And we bring them together for a symposium when they get to meet each other across all of the different partner institutions and um, uh, hear directly from faculty and academia. Another example of something we've been doing for many years is something called Amgebiotic Experience. It started with one teacher in the Newberry Park area of Thousand Oaks. If you think about biologic medicines, these are large molecules. They're made by bacterial cells. It's a very complicated process, and teachers decided early on that you know, they could partner with our scientists and develop a curriculum. 
So we work at the high school level to reach you know, 90,000 students a year to help students transform a bacterial cell into a protein factory. We use a red fluorescent protein. Why? Because you can see it with the naked eye. This is a program that, as I said, started in one school. We've expanded to 20 different sites across the world and are reaching 90,000 students um, a year. The idea here is twofold. One, the investment in the teachers. We give them the professional development. We provide professional grade equipment. And we give them training and support. When was, how comfortable is a high school teacher to, say, to, answer, to tell the students, I don't know the answer to that question. How do we transform teachers in learners again by creating safe environments where they can have this kind of conversation, learn from each other, and then go back and be the best teacher that they can be? We're proud of these two programs. But back to the principles I had, we're a global company. We are now in 100 different countries. We've taken some of these programs globally, but it's very expensive. It is very difficult to do. So we reached out to the folks at the Khan Academy. How many folks here have used Khan Academy? Nearly everyone. When we started working with them, they had about 350,000 users using their biology content a month. They're now at about 3.5 million users. The kind of effect that we can have as a philanthropic institution to say, this kind of reach was unachievable with the kinds of programs we have. We believe there's space for both. The other thing that's interesting to note here is as we looked at Khan Academy, we also explored digital versions of the other programs. The question then was a very simple business one, distribution. If I create the best content out there, but I'm in charge as the Amgen Foundation to get it in the hands of students and learners, do I have those networks? I don't. So the step back and saying we need the right solution, obviously for free, forever, and an amazing social entrepreneur in Sao Khan who uh, is all inspiring and we have had the chance to bring him on campus and uh, Mariana got to see him a few weeks ago while she was at Amgen. And then the last one I want to touch on is the same way as Khan Academy is the virtual classroom. As I think about the Amgen Scholars Program, I said 6,000 applicants 340 students get in. So there's like 5,600 students out there that I'm today saying, sorry, I do not have something to offer you. We're working with Harvard to invent a virtual laboratory program that is going to be launched now in, uh, I think it's the January, February timeframe. And the idea here is this is gonna be built on top of the edX platform. I don't know how many folks have taken the MOOCs. And what they're gonna do is using a concept called block store they're gonna tag individual courses, allow to create a dynamic repository that different blocks will be tagged, and give people the ability to mix and match. So now the unit, that when you start a class, you have a unit that's comprehensive and it's very deep. What if a teacher just wants a piece of a class that he or she did a long time ago, something they saw online? The ability to put all the resources in the hands of teachers, in the hands of learners, is something we're very excited about. The closing is really from a portfolio perspective and the angle of a for-profit business with a philanthropic arm that's focused on science education. Our vision is to connect, to create this continuum that supports learners throughout their uh, educational journey with a couple of different strategies and with solid uh, impact assessment and evaluation, and we can talk about that in Q&A if, if you have the interest. The two messages to leave you with are things that are, the second one, learning. That's the key skill. Whatever career you choose, if you don't continue investing in your own education, there ain't gonna be a place for you. And the value of teachers, that's something that most countries struggle with. I told you about the Amgen Foundation. The other parts of my job are the US patient assistance, free medicines for patients who can't afford them uh, in the United States. We have a corporate giving program. We're beginning to explore charitable bulk product donations outside the US and the effort around our broader social responsibility. So with that, uh, let me turn it back to the moderators. I'd like to introduce Mariana Pimenta. Do you wanna go ahead and make your way up? Uh, Mariana is a second year MBA here at UCLA Anderson, and she's a VP of Finance for the Healthcare Business Association.
who, by the way, is also a co-sponsor of this event tonight. So all of those, in the, you guys want to raise your hand, if guys and gals, if you're part of that association. We really appreciate the co-sponsorship of this event. Mariana also was, I have to say this, you know this, um, was part of the finalist winning team for a healthcare-related idea for an impact investing challenge competition at Wharton uh, with the team, also had an MD on the team, placing as one of the finalist teams for the first time. Can we give a shout out to Mariana? <laughs> um, and she also spent her summer at Amgen interning in the corporate strategy team as part of their finance and strategy leadership development program. Prior to Anderson, Mariana spent nine years working in the Brazilian financial market, holding positions in companies in real assets, private equity, consulting, and M&A, and she holds a Bachelor's of Business Administration from FGV, uh, one of the premier institutions also in Brazil. So with that, I'm going to hand over the floor. First of all, thank you so much for being here today and telling us more about your work with the Amgen Foundation and about corporate philanthropy. And I think a good place to start is um, to ask you, what is your vision for corporate philanthropy and for corporate social responsibility, and how has that changed over the years? Um, we've been always very fortunate to have a board of directors that has given us the latitude to make the investments that will have the largest impact. As you look around in a corporate philanthropy space, this place is evolving, but the Sometimes you see more as a marketing function. Are you doing the kinds of donations you're doing because it's for relationship building or what kind of impact you want to have? Amgen, from the beginning, was always very clear around the impact. My vision is really one of reach, significantly enhance it, and change the dialogue around what's possible in the classroom. Um, the second part is engaging our staff. Some companies are much further ahead than where we are in terms of how do we connect our staff with the communities, how do we connect our staff with the myriad of opportunities that they might have to have their own uh, impact. Um, I always, every time I talk to staff, I always, people, I always ask people, okay, so with these programs, how big do you think the, the, the foundation team is? Um, four people. Four people do what I described. How is that possible? couple of different ways. We have the right infrastructure in working with partners. So for the program at UCLA, we're financing a program director to run the program. But the main message to staff is really one of these programs are only possible because of their hard work, independently of where in the company they live, independently of what they do, their efforts to serve our mission, serving patients, every patient, every time, is what sustains these efforts. Enhancing this connection and delivering on the impact and the promise of lab exchange. How would you say that your team both define and measure success for the initiatives um, within corporate social responsibility? Um, I think the, <laughs> the impact question is one that um, comes up very often. There's some great literature around overhead for nonprofits, folks saying, talking about. CEOs of nonprofits and how much they make. Um, you gotta pay for talent. And at the end of the day, um, if I make a $10,000 grant, if the Amgen Foundation makes a $10,000 grant to an organization that has a budget of, I don't know, a couple of million dollars, how much of their results can, can I attribute to my $10,000 grant? That's a very uncomfortable question. Um, a lot of nonprofit organizations, I know that impact does some amazing work with them. The jobs of executive directors, fundraising. They're on the road trying to raise funds all the time. Our approach for those Amgen scholars and for biotech experiences, from the get go, to ask what is it that we're trying to accomplish and to engage a professional evaluator we use, in the case of scholars, we use Indiana University. They've been working with us for the last 13 years. Our goals with the program are primarily one to enhance the chances that these students will pursue a degree in, or continue their education in the science. So we have the data, 90% of them do so. Um, but the question of evaluation goes further. When you look at all of those 25 institutions, 24 institutions or so, 
Um, is there some competition between them? How do we celebrate successes, but how do we do so in a manner that strengthens the program? So I'll give you the example. Um, if you talk to folks doing a lot of this research, just to the students participating in the program, uh, it's hard to understand what they're doing. So you, sit, you sit down and say, so what have you been working on? And unless you have a scientific, back, scientific background, it's very hard to understand. So communications is a challenge for, uh, communication science is a challenge for all of the institutions. So we do a question to all the participants around how they feel about their ability to communicate. And one cohort, one group of students had much higher ratings for their school than others. So we plotted, we brought the 25 institutions together, just the management. No names, except on the top performer. The top performer, there's the name of the institution and the conversation. What is it that you're doing? What were they doing? They were partnering with the English department. They had an English faculty person come in and talk to the scientists about communications. It's such a simple idea and something that is at the, uh, available to all the other participants. And in this context, the job of the evaluation the job of the data collection was to facilitate the collective improvement of the program. So this is one example. It takes money, it takes resources, um, and you can't let go of it. With Khan Academy, it's fascinating. They have, they're doing some work in partnership with school districts, um, and Long Beach is one of them, where they have the data that shows that the, the use of Khan Academy, I think it's for about 30 minutes a week, where a student improves their scores on some of the tests, by more than twice than, other, than the students who don't participate in the program. So now stop and think about that. 30 minutes a week. In Brazil, Khan Academy, with the support of uh, the Brazilian Bill Gates, uh, uh, a gentleman by the name of, of, of Lehman, um, they are doing, they're implementing the curriculum in some, some schools, and other schools that don't have the program serve as a control. So they're able to show side by side to fourth grade two eighth grade classes, one that has the program, one doesn't have. Does that solve, is that a silver bullet? Of course not, but it allows for a much more focused conversation on the place these interventions can make a difference. Um, and, and it goes on and on. The question you talk about, you know, outputs, outcomes, and impact. In most of the conversations, these are all blended. And they're blended because it's very, very hard to split one from the other. Okay, now um, I really want to ask you about um, a milestone of Amgen Foundation that I personally found to be very exciting. Um, last year, Amgen partnered with directly, Direct Relief to donate products to support cancer care in 18 low and middle income countries. And I was wondering if you could tell us more about how that experience was like and about the challenges that you had to overcome to make that happen. Sure, sure. Um, it took us a long time to get to the milestone of delivering on that donation. And you read a lot about product donations and you know um, their place in society, the sustainability of the efforts. These are the whole lectures and conversations around it. We were in a situation where we had some excess inventory, and it was biologics, cold chain requirements. The reality in the supply chain across developing countries, the ability to absorb and utilize those products is um, often limited. How do I, within Amgen, have a group telling me this product is available and understand can this nonprofit partner, can they take care of our product and meet all of our quality requirements? Part of the regulations on in our industry around adverse events, we are accountable for reporting adverse events for every patient. Think about that. How can we advance the donation? You know, it's going to go all the way across the world to a place where we don't have a facility, we don't have relationships. So the partnership with Direct Relief and if you don't know a lot about them, check, check them out online. They're right here in Santa Barbara. Um, they are 
They are on SAP. They are registered pharmacy across the entire country. They do amazing work around the world. We've done work with them on a humanitarian basis for many, many years. They say every patient, independent of being paying patient or not, deserves the same kind of attention, the same kind of care. Um, had about 75 people across Amgen that I had to work with, from tax, from supply chain. The product was in Europe, so we had to understand you know, how to, we had to engage a third party logistics and all this terminology I had never even be, been privy to. The beauty of the process was as we ask questions, as we learn about different functions within a large enterprise to make our products available for patients, the reaction say, how can I help? The products have been delivered. I think one of the best success stories is in Paraguay, where the one-time donation made last year was roughly 25% of their filgrastim, which is a medicine that boosts uh, uh, white blood cells. 25% um, of their budget, and this essentially allowed them to buy a second chemotherapy medicine for the country, something they didn't have the resources to do. My goal with a program like that is more than anything to start a conversation. When we make this kind of donation and we stay in touch with the partners, I can now go back to my peers in the company and talk about, here's the impact we have had in Paraguay. Here's the reality of our product is making possible for a small number of patients. And with that, accelerate the conversation. I think a biggest challenge in a lot of ways when we have, when you look at these programs, when you look at efforts, is the sense of how will they grow? And ultimately, how much do you expect to accomplish? And the challenge is how do you balance aggressive ambitions with being truly centered and feet on the ground and understanding your organization, understanding the resource constraints, understanding all sorts of, of, of dilemmas that the company may have that they just haven't dealt with yet. Part of my job is to bring the outside in. Some days are amazing and we are able to do some great projects. Some days are very difficult, like any other job, like any other career, very challenging to make uh, the progress and the speed that we'd like to make it. Um, my hope is that uh, these programs will continue to evolve. Um, Novartis has done some amazing things with a program where they sell medicines in India for a dollar, a dollar per patient per month. Now, small molecules meaning pills. They have a volume-driven business. We're selling a margin-driven business. Are there opportunities for that kind of thinking to be brought into Amgen? I don't know. I think that leads to my next question, which is what do you view as the next milestones for Amgen Foundation? Global. How do we get Lab Exchange launched? How do we um, strengthen the connection between the world of education in the world of uh, work. Um, we have a lot of opportunities ahead. Um, the biggest uh, complaint we hear about the lab exchange promise is, why did they make it a nonprofit? Because they could have made a lot of money out of it. And the leadership there is very aligned with, with us to say, we want to provide this for free for everyone. So we're excited, it's a promise, and we'll see how it's going to go. Thank you. So I want to change a little bit um, gears and I want to talk to you about um, how the Business Roundtable released and signed a statement this summer stating that now the company's fundament, fundamental commitment is now to all stakeholders, uh, including customers, employees, suppliers, communities and shareholders, not just shareholders. And I want to ask you, what is your view on this broadening of scope? Um, during this business roundtable, and how do you address certain shareholder beliefs that this new commitment gives too much power to company management? Yeah. That's a delicate and challenging question. My sense is the business roundtable coming out with a statement like this is very important simply that it's happening. Of course, the big question is what kind of actions are going to follow these kinds of statements. Um, 65 out of the 100 largest economies in the world are companies. 150 out of the 200 top economies are companies. 
the role of for-profit corporations in society is something that um, if we don't stare into it, um, it's very hard to say how things are going to evolve. Um, the other part of the Business Roundtable uh, statement is, yes, every now and then I still hear some people saying, oh, Milton Friedman, and it's shareholders, shareholders, and shareholders only. But you'd be surprised, you know. Stakeholders are asking a lot of questions. Future employees, when you're interviewing at companies and you're asking questions, my senior executives are saying, you know, they want to know about what we're doing about access to medicines. Why aren't we on the Access to Medicines Index? Unless these questions come up, I don't have the opportunity for that kind of dialogue. Sustainalytics, you go to Yahoo Finance, there's a tab on Sustainalytics. Some peer companies have dedicated, their staff are asking so much about their company's performance there, that they've dedicated a full headcount to work on Sustainalytics scoring. Whether the company believes it does great things or not, the rating agencies are out there and you can argue, are they in the shaming business? Depends on your perspective. But it says that the world is paying attention. And one of our uh, corporate board members, that her new book's about to come out, Reinventing Capitalism. This moment and this kind of conversation that I so appreciate having the opportunity to have with you is, we don't know the answers. We don't know the answers. When I was, um, when I think about my job, the, the role of the social entrepreneur from within the company, how can I influence where the business is going? How can I facilitate conversations that otherwise would not have happened? These are things that, you know, as I think about my days in high school and in college, I could never, ever have traced a path like what I've charted. When I told my boss in audit that I was going to go into the Amgen Foundation and be like employee number two there, he looked at me and said, no, <laughs> you're not going. And again, I, I was uh, naive and young and I said, oh, I, I am actually not asking you, I'm telling you that this is what I'm doing. I don't know if I would have done that these days. But, but, but the sense of, of, you know, the balance of, you know, the heart and the mind. People know what's right. You know, the Shkrelis of the world, our industry is at the bottom of, of, you know, compared to tobacco companies. And I've never been more excited about Amgen than I am now. Our scientists are making medicines that are really going to have a very positive impact on patients. You hear people talking about curing cancer. Whether it's going to happen or not, I don't know. But the ambition, and this is, CEO says, it's the biocentry. Most of physics, most of chemistry is pretty clear. Around biology, Sal Khan said he was doing a video on biology and he got stuck. There was something about T cells he didn't understand. He called faculty at Harvard. The answer was, we don't know. We don't know. You can tell your students that that's one of the things that perhaps they can research, they can work on and find the answers themselves. I'm excited, I'm part of the conference, conference board has groups of folks working uh, in different fields. So I work with all of my peers in, in philanthropy and CSR. We're grappling with the same issues. It's an exciting moment. You're in the right place, engaged too. I heard there are three or four different classes in uh, the social impact space. When I graduated, I had one. I was the inaugural class on social entrepreneurship. Um, take advantage, take advantage. It's a very, very exciting field. So I have one final question and then we can move on to the and open Q&A to the audience. And um, what, uh, can you share some of the lessons that you learned throughout your career uh, about, how, about network building and overcoming challenges uh, for MBA students and other members of the UCLA community that want to drive change? Um, the simplest way I'd put it is like it's, it's follow your head and your heart. There's a balance there. Um, 12 years on, and I remember, you know, I remember the accounting classes. I remember a lot of that. But there were two favorite classes. There was a negotiations class with Lippmann, and there was a class called Thinking on Your Feet with Professor Furstenberg. 
And I remember tell, talking to my colleagues, and I'm going to take this class. They're like, oh, no, I'm taking whatever it is with whatever. I'm not going to mention it. <laughs> <laughs> the conversations we've had in those settings have been more important than any technical knowledge. Don't get me wrong. If you, don't, if you can't do your job, there's no place for you. If you don't have the technical knowledge, there's no place for you. That's table stakes. That gets you into the door every day. Now, where do you go from there? First, and used to talk about the, the, the kind of things, like the tyranny of or, so many times. Is it this or that? And how do you pause and say, can we reframe it? Could it potentially be both? In this space, if we do right on science education, who wins, Amgen or society? We both do, if we do right. I spent the day yesterday in Phoenix on the US patient assistance side where we have, for the free goods program, we serve, provide free medicines for tens of thousands of patients. We have a call center with 60 people in Phoenix and we have a total of about 200. Now, they are getting an application form from a physician. They are transcribing it into their own uh, proprietary system. And we're talking about error rates and all sorts of dashboards and data-driven. And we're talking about defects and parts per million. Six Sigma stuff that I did at GE 25 years ago. The conversation now to be able to challenge them in saying, yes, it's charitable about serving these patients. But every time a mistake is made, if we don't pay our people, if we're losing people, if turnover is high because we're paying minimum wage for call center people, we're not addressing, every, we're, we're, we might be solving the patient issue, but we're not having the impact we can have. So I can challenge them and have a conversation that connects their reality in running the business with the social imperative that we have to serve patients in need. You never, and the other part that, that I'd say, is like, it's very hard to know what is going to be useful over time. So learn as much as you can. Stay curious. I think that's really the... I think it makes sense. Fantastic. Thank you, Eduardo. Now, um, if you please want to raise your hands if you have a question, and somebody will give you the mic. Hello, thank you. Thank you for coming in and speaking. Um, my name is Pradni, and I'm in the Executive MBA program. And I have two questions not related. Uh, the first question is you mentioned the uh, outreach programs that you're doing to get science into the schools. And the one slide you so showed made me think, so if there's a, a privileged person in Newbury Park who's studying science, they can then go on to their privileged school and learn science. And then maybe if they're already at Harvard, they can do a postdoc at Caltech and all this is helping. What are you guys doing to reach the underprivileged areas where we could make an economic impact to teach science in schools where they have where they may not have labs. Like it's one thing to already be in Newberry Park, you're probably already in AP chemistry, but if you've never even heard of chemistry, mm -hmm. how do you improve that access? And then the second question I have, sort of like that, you mentioned how science is taught and we're not curious enough in, and I wonder if that's more of a Western view, mm -hmm. because China doubled the number of science graduates they have yeah. in just 10 years. 50% yeah. of all their university graduates are science, and they're not taking the curiosity approach. They're taking the, you need to learn science and math if you want to be successful. Yeah. So how much of it is culture? Because we had a strong science program in the US when we were doing space exploration. Yeah. Now it's not there. So again, how much is Western? And the other question about inner cities. I was in Japan, Singapore, and um, Turkey earlier this year. And one of the slides I had with the magazine covers had a picture of you know, the war on science. And my, people looked at me and said, like, that's an American issue. We don't question science. This is the reality. So it's very, part of my challenge is then, how do we think about, from a global perspective, how do we affect change in a relevant local way? The question of, of the, the populations we try to serve um, it's a balance. Um, with amateur biotech experience, the idea is instead of financing the building of laboratories in individual schools, which would be expensive, we think about maximizing asset utilization. It's about $20,000 worth of biotech equipment that um, a local partner 
gets it from one school to the other. So how do we bring, because the schools don't have the labs, how do we bring the labs to the schools? We have teachers who have been doing the program for more than a decade. So South LA, all across the, 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 the city. Challenges around the numbers we can reach. Um, and uh, from, a, from the Amazon Scholars perspective, it's an interesting question in the sense of, we try to democratize access to the Harvards of the world, so we tell them, you get 15 spots, no more than 25% can come from Harvard, all the other 75% have to come from other institutions. We have had, I think, nearly 1,000 uh, schools represented. My sense is that to have a meaningful impact is going to be more through the, the online platforms. What Khan Academy has been able to do in Long Beach, in really, they do a couple of different things. One is the flipped classroom, the idea of you assign work for the student to do at home, and the, they come and do the exercises in school. So as a teacher, you have a dashboard that says of all my students, you know, eight out of 10 did the readings, did the videos, two didn't. And the ones who did, they spent time in this manner. Some of them, I can see, they got stuck on the third minute when there is a complex concept. The idea that the teacher can then understand the reality of the student. Long Beach, they have a superintendent who's been there for, I think, the last 10 or 15 years. His commitment was powerful enough to engage the teachers in a manner that makes sense for the teachers. I think that the dilemma every time we talk about teachers is with a biotech experience, you thought about, you know, what, why don't we have a partnership with the district? Well, if we do, are we going to impose the program? It's going to be another imposition on a science teacher that's already overburdened. But burdened. I'm very hopeful that the data that Khan Academy is going to provide is going to facilitate a significant increase in the, in the service of underserved youth. And we're going to do that not only in the US, but globally. Lab exchange, I think, is going to be even, the promise is even higher if you think about um, the developing world where the infrastructure for laboratories, we don't have the financial resources to, to build it. Can we skip it and just do it all online with uh, something like lab exchange? So partnerships with governments, uh, conversations with uh, the UN and other multilateral institutions are coming. Thank you very much for your presentation. My name is Bora Gunner. Um, uh, I'm glad that you actually mentioned Turkey during your presentation. I'm from Turkey. And one of the comments that I have with respect to scientific education that, yes, it is great, like, in, like the scientific education that you get in the listed countries are great, but in, when it comes to science, a big part of the education is research with this, which does not mm -hmm. really exist. So how do we, is creating the research opportunities, creating the infrastructure for people to practice science on a bench, a part of your foundation scope? And uh, another part of the question that I would like to ask is that um, you mentioned um, adoptive cell therapies, the um, bi-specific target engagers, precision medicine, which are uh, like a big part of the immuno-oncology approaches within the United States, but these things are unknown outside of the um, other countries. Turkey is one of them where chemotherapy is still pretty much the way of treatment. Um, do you guys focus on uh, education, educating patients as well as the students to drive not only like science but also understanding that these kinds of technologies exist for their treatment? So on the, on the patient and the physician education that's done elsewhere in the company, I think there's uh, uh, the realization that uh, there's a lot of work to be done. I am often this question like should we give it for free? should you sell it? And my hope is back to Furstenberg, it's somewhere in the middle. Can we invent different mechanisms? Now, um, economic pressure, economic inequality, huge, huge challenges that we're not even having the right conversation, even if we have the avenues for the right conversations. There's a, there isn't a day that my industry is not you know, in the news and the politics of drug pricing. The only hope we have is medicines clinical trials. So the way we think about it, there's so much nuance that every way you, you double click on it. The way we do clinical trials. Our trial participants, does it match the population profile? How do you think about consent? 
after you know, talk about Tuskegee and the history in the country, how do you educate people that on one sense you're giving them an opportunity to get a product that might save their lives without the whole ecosystem around my needs are so broad given the struggles I have, underemployed, housing issues, all sorts of, of challenges. So um, what I'm excited about, and when I mention you know, 30 people attending, 30 executives attending that presentation is the expectation that somebody else will be asking the question is kind of too easy, right? The challenge is for you, how do you raise the questions to facilitate a conversation that otherwise would not have happened? And, and on the first question on, we, in terms of the, at the, undergrad, at the undergraduate level of the research, we focus on engine scholars, and that's the limitation with the 24 uh, partner institutions. But in Turkey, we've been doing some work uh, with an organization called Development Workshop. It's a pretty large nonprofit, and they, we work with them on bringing inquiry-based science education to the classroom. They teach, they bring teachers from all over the country to Ankara, train them, and the idea there is not even as sophisticated as the amateur biotech experience doing real, you know, transforming the bacteria. It's about how do you use equipment to just help kids think like a scientist, you know? Ask a question, formulate a hypothesis, design a test, fail, try it again. And the feedback, and I, part of the, part of the, one of my highlights in the trip was hearing the demand to say, you know, you need to up our grants because teachers want not only to come to the program, but they want resources so that they can go back and then train other teachers. And that's the part where, you know, education very quickly gets political to. The sciences are a relatively safe space and a space where my job as the funder is to trust the teacher is to have a partner in the country that has a credibility with the teacher. The MG Biotech experience, when we started talking about expanding it globally, the conversations were, I don't think the rest of the world is going to want a corporate branded curriculum. France, of all places, they'll probably never want it. We're there. We are working with them. We're working in China. There was a question about you know, the test staking. What kind of skills are needed? is do we want to become best test takers or do we want to become able to navigate the complexities with creativity, collaboration, communications, problem solving. Um, so it's challenging, very challenging. I just want to thank you again, Eduardo, for coming and talking to us about your exciting career and projects at Amgen Foundation. And also thank everyone who participated. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.